Good day, Grade 9 students, and welcome to our Arts 9. For today's lesson, our objectives are the following. First, identify distinct characteristics of sculptures during Western classical traditions. Second, reflect on and derive the mood, idea, or message from selected artwork. And lastly, compare the characteristics of sculptures produced during the different periods. In our previous lesson, we have studied the different paintings under these three different periods. And for today's lesson, we are going to study the sculpture under these three different periods. For the ancient art, we have the prehistoric and Egyptian era. For the classical art, we have the Greek and Roman era. And for the medieval art, we have the Byzantine, Romanesque, and Gothic. Let's go now first to the ancient art. And under this ancient art, we have the prehistoric era and also the ancient Greek era. In prehistoric sculpture, the term mobiliarity art is commonly used. It is used to denote any small-scale prehistoric art that is movable. The materials used in making sculptures vary according to region and locality. It is usually carved in stone, bone, or ivory. Actually, it is difficult to know the exact meaning or use of this. Some artists also sculpted in stone, especially softer varieties like limestone, steatite, and sandstone. This is an example sculpture during this period. It is called the Venus of Willendorf. It has been suggested that she is a fertility figure, a good luck totem, a mother goddess symbol, or an aphrodisiac made by men for the appreciation of men. It is carved from limestone with excessively heavy breast and abdomen. This is used as charm to ensure fertility. The lack of face has incited some archaeologists and philosophers to view this as a universal mother. Many scientists also believe that the coils of the Venus hair were meant to represent the cycle of women's period or ovulation. Another example is the Venus of Brasimpoi. It was interpreted as a woman based on the feminine shape of the chin and apparent hair or headdress. The woman here had a hood and this represented the human face and hairstyle during Upper Paleolithic Era. Under ancient art, we also have the ancient Egyptian sculpture. Egyptian sculpture was always functional. Despite of the aestheticism of their works, this is not their main purpose because it was designed to serve as a home for a spirit or a god or to make the deceased afterlife place pleasant. During this period, symbolic elements were widely used such as forms, hieroglyphics, relative size, location, materials, color, actions, and gestures. Now, what are the characteristics of the sculptures? Let's go now to the first characteristic of Egyptian sculpture. Symbolisms were heavily used to represent the gods. They were represented as composite creatures with animal heads on human bodies. Egyptian gods are part human and part animal form to depict the personality of that particular god or goddess in a symbolic way. For example, we have the goddess of ferocious war, Sekhmet. Sekhmet was sometimes shown with the head of a lion, as lions are ferocious creatures. Similarly with Anubis. Anubis was shown with a jackal head because the jackal was associated with the necropolis and Anubis was a god of the dead. Second characteristic of Egyptian sculpture is that relief compositions were arranged in horizontal lines to record an event or to represent an action, meaning to say it is dependent on a background surface and its composition must be extended in a plane in order to be visible. For example, the Pero Menkaure and his queen. It has a relief composition as it stood out in relief. 
let's go now to the third characteristic of Egyptian sculpture. Most of the time, the gods were shown larger than humans, the kings larger than their followers, and the dead larger than the living. The fourth characteristic of Egyptian sculpture is that empty space were filled with figures or hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics can be seen on their sculpture. These were the characters of the ancient Egyptian writing system. This is Queen Nefertiti. It is painted limestone. She was a queen of the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt, the great royal wife of Pharaoh Akhenaten. The fifth characteristic is that all individual components were all brought to the plane of representation and laid out like writing. We are done with the ancient art and now let's go to classical art. Classical art is divided into two era. We have the Greek and the Roman. During this period as well, the sculpture of ancient Greece from 800 to 300 BCE took early inspiration from Egyptian and Near Eastern monumental art and over centuries evolved into a uniquely Greek vision of the art form. They were tense and stiff, their bodies were hidden with enfolding robes, and they had finally evolved and showed all points of human anatomy and proportion. One of the most popular style of the Greek sculpture was the Hellenistic style. It had elaborated patterns, mannered, and arrangement of figures and groups, and emphasis on the representation of movement for dramatic effect. Sculptures of this time period not only focused on fictional stories and mythological gods, it was also a way to honor people of the time period. These people were usually rulers, kings, or in this case, a scholar. Myron the Discobolus is an example sculpture during this period. It is one of the most iconic artworks of classical antiquity. It is originally sculpted in bronze by an Athenian man called Myron. The statue has gained fame largely through its many bronze and marble copies made by the Romans. The Discopolis is a physically gorgeous young male athlete frozen in the pose of launching his disc. Although he is involved in a demanding situation, his face and body are unusually relaxed and composed. His head is turned towards his sporting equipment. Under the classical art, we also have the classical Roman sculpture. Most Roman sculptures are made of monumental terracotta. Terracotta is most commonly used to describe a type of sculpture and glazed ceramic art or decorative architecture made from a coarse porous clay, which is noted for its versatility, cheapness, and durability. They also produce reliefs in the great Roman triumphal columns with continuous narrative relief around. Now, what is a relief in sculpture? It is dependent on a background surface and its composition must be extended in a plane in order to be visible. An example of this is the Portonacio sarcophagus. The Portonacio sarcophagus is dated to about 200 AD and was used for the burial of a wealthy Roman general who was active in the campaigns of Marcus Aurelius. The sculpture shows influences similar to those of the column of Marcus Aurelius. This sarcophagus is one of the many Roman battle sarcophagi that was probably made in Athens. This was carved using marble and it depicts battle scenes between Romans and Germans. Another example under classical Roman sculpture is the sarcophagus from Servetiri. This is made of terracotta. A husband and wife are shown reclining comfortably. Their welcoming and warm gestures invite the viewer to interact with the sarcophagus. The male figure may have been holding an egg, while the female figure could have held a pomegranate both of which are symbols of eternity and rebirth in ancient times. We are done with the ancient art and the classical art. Let's go now to the medieval art. 
medieval art is divided into three era. We have the Byzantine, the Romanesque, and the Gothic. Byzantine sculpture has many themes. We have religious, everyday life scene, motives from nature, animals were used as symbols, acrostic signs, and syllable or word of different lines, and putting it together that contained a great theological significance. Under Byzantine era, we have the Barberini diptych as sculpture. It was made during the first half of the 6th century in the city of Constantinople. It consists of five ivory plaques which are fitted together. The main plaque is located in the middle and is believed to be depicting Emperor Justinian after a victory. This historical artifact currently resides in Paris, France at the Louvre. Next to Byzantine sculpture, we have the Romanesque sculpture. Some of the most famous sculpture pieces are relic quarries, altar frontals, crucifixes, and devotional images. These can all be found in the churches. Under the Romanesque sculpture, we have the Last Judgment. It is believed that the sculptural work of the cathedral was done completely by Gis Liberto. This art served as a method of teaching to those who were illiterate. By depicting scenes in a realistic manner, observers were frightened by the horrific images portrayed, thus influencing them to be believers. Under the medieval art, we are done with the Byzantine and the Romanesque era. Let's go now to the Gothic sculpture. Gothic sculptures have a greater freedom of style. Gothic art existed as monumental religious sculpture in churches. They are also begun to project outward. As we can see in the resurrection of the Virgin, the sculpture projected outward. That's it for the sculpture under the ancient, classical, and medieval period. See you again on our next video about the architecture during these periods. See you!